Let's bring in our next guest from another swing state, Virginia. Susanna Gibson is a Democratic candidate for the Virginia House of Delegates in the 57th District. She is a lifelong Virginian and Democrat. She's a graduate of both the University of Virginia and Columbia University, not too shabby, and has worked as a nurse practitioner and a public health expert in Richmond for 15 years. She's cared for patients in all sorts of specialties, including geriatrics, emergency medicine, internal medicine, and obesity medicine. And she ex has extensive experience managing the most medically complex patients in Virginia and a track record of effectively utilizing local and state resources to best help those in need. She also was a key leader in the CMS independence at home demonstration process. She helped create, start, and lead the VCU Center for Advanced Health Management, a medical home model managing the most complex adult patients in Virginia, and so much more. Her priorities include defending reproductive rights, putting an end to the gun violence epidemic, addressing Virginia's lack of mental health and substance use disorders, and improving Virginia's infrastructure and resources to support aging citizens. She is running in the Virginia House of Delegates in the new 57th district in Western Henrico County. It's, this is a new open seat with no incumbent, which is super interesting. That is a two point margin race and one of the most competitive districts in Virginia. Her website is susannagibson.com. Now, Susanna's district also won about 51% for Youngkin, who is the Republican governor of the state now, and 49% for Terry McAuliffe, who was the previous um, Democratic governor of Virginia. So there's really no telling what will happen. Susanna, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I am excited to be here. I'm so excited. So what's your why, Susanna? So I've been trying to come up with a succinct way of saying this. <laughs> I'm still struggling a little bit. So as you said, I'm a nurse practitioner. I actually have a degree in religious studies from UVA, uh, Christianity and African religions. Hmm. I thought I wanted to go to law school. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, and during my time at UVA, I volunteered at the UVA Teen Health Center, which is a nurse practitioner run center um, and just fell in love with reproductive health um, and decided to go back to school uh, to become a nurse practitioner to work in reproductive health and mm -hmm. African medicine. And um, Funnily enough, I did go back to school, but I ended up working in geriatrics and internal medicine for most of my career. Um, but reproductive health is something that has always been a passion of mine. And um, when the Dobbs decision came out this summer, for those of you who don't know, when Roe was reversed, it was essentially the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Mm. And I already volunteer at uh, Planned Parenthood here in Virginia, and I'm already involved in the National Women's March, but I thought, what else can I do? And this particular seat had just opened up. Um, Virginia has redistricted based on the 2020 census, but we have yet to have our state elections to reflect that. And the old Republican incumbent actually got moved out of the district and he can no longer run. So I am running and I'm running hard because I'm determined to do something about this in Virginia. When you say you're determined to do something about this, are you talking about the assault on reproductive rights? Like what issue is really paramount to, it sounds like Roe v. Wade is incredibly important. So that what, is my driving, really, I mean, truly it is, the assault on not just reproductive rights, but on women, right? Mm -hmm. Women, girls, um, because that is truly what it is. And that is what it's about. It's about power. Um, and they are using our bodies, our lives to, um, as political sound bites, right? To uh, further political agendas, no matter what the cost is to uh, myself, you, my sisters, my neighbors, my daughter, Right. Um, and I'm just not going to let that happen. Um, I, love, I mean, I think that's so the way you put that is really, really beautiful. They are using our bodies and our lives as political sound bites. And yep. it's all about power. And, it is. and you know, I, my, I had an episode called America's War on Women and some 
someone, some jerk commented and was like, oh, your political bias is really clear. I was like, I'm sorry, but if, if I voted and I had control over whether or not you had a vasectomy, would you be, would you be angry at me? <laughs> would you consider that it's or exactly on whether or not you could have access to Viagra? That would is I, exactly. would you be angry at me? Like, you know, you know, like I'm not making any decisions about a man's body. So why should a man make any decisions about my body? They it shouldn't. Doesn't, they don't, but but it's so it's so ingrained into the expectation of America that there's this control of women, and that's something that I think we really need to push back on. Like yes. our bodies, our choice, our lives, our choice. Like you cannot control us. And it's something that's so deeply ingrained from such a young age, too. Because mm. um, people have been asking me, well, so why are you just running now? Have you ever thought about running before? And I say, of course, right? So my mom worked for McGovern. She worked for Jimmy Carter. Um, she was chairman of the Charlottesville City School Board forever. And I've always thought about it. But truly, deep down, when I was growing up, I don't know how, you old, how old you are. I'm almost 40. But um, when I was growing up, everyone started saying, oh, girls, you can be whatever you want to be. You can do whatever you want to do. But there was never a female face in our government to put towards that mm. for me. And it took a lot of um, self-reflection and um, motivation and motivated by now anger and fear for what our country and Virginia is evolving into mm. to get past that deeply ingrained, well, I don't know if I can do it because there's never been a female, whatever it may be, president of the United States, or at the time when I was growing up, no female vice president of the United States, right. no governor. So, um, it, but it's something that's ingrained in us from a very, very, very young age, that sexism. Um, and, and, you know, you, you can't be what you can't see. Um, I, like it really is like that. The other thing that's so interesting, you know, I encourage people to watch the documentary misrepresentation if you can find it in your library, but it's the, that when, that girls want to run for office in equal numbers as boys until a certain age. And then it's like after age 12, all of a sudden that drops. They just like, they don't want to be president anymore. And a lot of it, I think, has to do with um, just like hypersexualization in the media, demeaning, body image issues, the way that the society just like runs down girls. And that girls, you know, they, they start to believe that their voice doesn't matter in politics. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, you know, hopefully changing as we're seeing Gen Z be, you know, and millennials be enraged in a way that I don't think any generation ever was and committed to social purpose in a way that they never were before. Yes. But it, absolutely, it starts at a very, very early age. Yep. I see it in my daughter. I have a uh, seven-year-old daughter and a nine-year-old son. And uh, the confidence in their intelligence, I will say, is remarkable from a very young age, noticeable. Mm. Um, and I have made sure to parent them the exact same way. They've had the exact same education, gone through the same schools, all of those things. So um, as a nurse practitioner, why is it important that abortion stay, you know, it's still legal in Virginia, right? But why is it important that it stay legal in Virginia? What, why is it important that abortion is legal from the from the viewpoint of a healthcare practitioner? Why is it important that you make the decision on what happens and the person and not the government? I hold on. Hold Got on. the boys coming in? Out. Love you. Out. No. Competing, competing priorities as women. This is what we do. <laughs> No, no, out. I'm not kidding you. One. My daughter came in, she needs Band-Aid. Um, I told you I'm <laughs> hiding in the bathroom from them. Um, so the reason that it's important for abortion to be legal in Virginia is because abortion is health care. I mean, that is just point blank, period, not negotiable, not debatable. It is health care. And the best health care policy is made based on scientific facts right? And not on the political whims of politicians. Um, abortion is an essential part of healthcare. So we're talking about um, women's right to survival, looking at our uh, uh, maternal mortality rates, right? In, in the United States are abysmal, um, but also looking at pregnancy-related complications. Mm -hmm. So the treatment for ectopic pregnancies, the treatment for uh, miscarriages, right? Those are... Sorry, I'm laughing because I'm remembering, I can't remember what Republican was like, 
well, can't you just in an ectopic pregnancy, can't you just pull it out of the, the tube and stick it in the uterus? It was like no understanding of science or how women's bodies work. I was well, like, bonkers. Exactly right. That is exactly right. And so in our Virginia General Assembly, there is one nurse practitioner in the House of Delegates, Don Adams. She's fantastic. Um, and there is Siobhan Donovan, who is in the Senate, who is a OBGYN, who is a pro-life Catholic OBGYN, mm -hmm. who does not necessarily practice what she, how she governs. And um, with the redistricting, so we're talking about running for the 2023, Virginia and New Jersey have their off-year election cycles. Um, and abortion is absolutely on the ballot. Abortion right now, reproductive health right now in Virginia is already in a precarious state. So the Virginia General Assembly in our House of Delegates, the Republicans have a three seat majority. And now post redistricting, there are eight seats in Virginia that are actually able to be flipped. So turned from conservative to Democrat. And the seat that I am running in is one of them. Um, and it is actually probably the most competitive of all of them um, because it is an open seat. It's a new district. Uh, it's a 51 uh, Youngkin, 49 McAuliffe district estimated. And, and truly, I think it's even better than that. It is the suburbs of Richmond. It is cul-de-sac families. Um, and every single month, there are younger and younger families moving in, and the district is becoming more and more democratic. Um, but this is why this matters, right? So reproductive health choice, that is why this particular election and this seat matters. Um, in the Senate right now, for the Virginia State Senate, the Democrats have a one-seat majority. Um, that one seat is held by Joe Morrissey, who... Um, I don't know if you know who Joe Morrissey is. He is um, a pro-life Catholic state senator who has quite the checkered past and a pretty poor reputation. Um, but it's absolutely on the ballot. And it is vitally important that Democrats um, and pro-choice Democrats actually take the majority in the Virginia House in 2023. And because of that, I am running. And I'll tell you what, I got in. There are two men, of course, who uh, decided to file and run before I did. They decided two months before I did because I am in it and I'm in it early, but they got in it even earlier because of the competitiveness. Um, and then, they're running as Republicans? One is running as a Republican. One is running as a Democrat. They are both 60 year old and over um, white men. Uh, so the Virginia General Assembly is 29% women. Mm -hmm. And the majority of those men are over the age of 55 and about half of that over 65. So wow. um, it's not surprising who I'm running against, but you know, even with uh, a lot of the men and there are some great men, right? But I, truly believe that we need women at the table when decisions are being made about women's bodies um, and women's lives. So they can sympathize, but they don't actually know truly what it's like. It's not their body, right, on the line. Right. They're not the one that has to sit there with sepsis and sit at their house and wait for their body to deconstruct and wonder if they're going to die just so they can get, <laughs> can get health care. Yeah. So saying, as the father of daughters, does not work for me. No, what are you doing? Yeah. What are you actually doing to help us, help women advocate for us? And protect and protect their lives. It was so interesting. I just did a show on um, Iran, on the protests in Iran, you know, with women. And, you know, my guest was saying she feels like, and I don't know about this, but I kind of agree. She was like, Something that's so unique right now in Iran is that all of the, there's so many men that are standing up for women's rights now in Iran. Like they are alongside the women, they are protecting them, they are helping them, they are advocating for them. And she's like, I don't see that in America, you know? And, and she's kind of right. Like, I don't see, there's there's some men at the, you know, the, the pro-choice rallies, but I mean, I'm, I'm also- stand in out. Yeah, I'm also in DC because so it's, it's 97% Democrat. So I have no idea what it looks like in other places. Um, but we we do we need men advocating not just for our rights but for, for for our lives. I mean, maternal mortality was predicted in places where it's overturned to go up by forty percent 
Yep. Forty percent went to overcoming. People don't understand that, and they don't understand why, and they don't think about well, right? So the way, and and I could get all into this, but essentially they're not thinking about hypertension. They're not thinking about gestational diabetes. They're not thinking of uncontrolled bleeding, right? Um, and how that affects maternal mortality, but also later on down the road, right? So gestational diabetes doubles your increased risk of developing diabetes, type two diabetes later on in life right? Which yeah. shortens your lifespan, increases risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, chronic kidney disease, all of these things. So people are not really truly understanding the downstream implications and why that is so important for women's health, right? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's a challenge, but it is one that is so important and so necessary. Um, Let's switch gears, Susanna. I want to talk about gun violence because yes. we have a gun violence epidemic. Yes, we do. And yet, like I was saying earlier, there's somehow the Republican Party has painted itself as the protectors of law, order, and safety, and painted as the Democrats that are weak on crime, even though, you know, Republicans are the ones running around with their assault weapons. So- And voting we, not to- uh, And voting not to implement fund, any yes. common sense gun yeah. reforms, even yeah. though most Americans do support them. Yes. So what would you do about gun violence? So- as I think a scientist and nurse practitioner, right, a healthcare provider, I am big into evidence-based evidence evidence -based. policy. Yes. And Johns Hopkins actually has a wonderful gun violence prevention um, center. And I believe it is uh, partnered with Bloomberg. And they study, in particular, gun violence intervention programs. And so a lot of what that is, and it particularly here when I'm thinking about Virginia and the actual district that I represent, there's a bunch of things we can do implementing community violence intervention programs, hospital-based intervention programs. So of course, strengthening licensing laws and red flag laws and these things, but there are other interventions we can do as well that should be able to make a huge difference. Um, so what is community-based interventions? What does that mean? So community-based interventions and hospital-based interventions are essentially when these patients come into the hospital system or when these patients or people become um, identified by the social workers or community systems in place. And there are a bunch of different interven interventions they do, but one of those is having outreach. So specific outreach to people who are at the most risk for gun violence um, to discuss yeah retaliation, other options, resources in the community, um, and really like a mentoring ship program as well, mm -hmm. but um, supporting people. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about those hospital-based intervention programs. Um, and then there are other common sense things we can do, aka what they call like making this public spaces cleaner and greener. So cleaning up um, abandoned parking lots, tearing down abandoned buildings, improving street lighting, right? All of these things have been shown to actually make a significant improvement in the decreasing of gun violence. Mm -hmm. um, and so truly looking at the data and the studies, I think is going to be the most important thing. Because when you're talking about such an issue that is so uh, controversial and hotly debated, again, I'm not quite sure why, but um, using data and facts to actually and saying, hey, this is actually the true evidence that has been shown to do this. Why don't we implement that? Using numbers and data and studies is I think one of the ways that I would be able to talk to people on the other side and make small incremental changes towards reducing gun violence. Um, of course, I feel that there's no need, no place for assault style weapons on the streets. Um, they should not be available. They have no place in our society. Weapons of war, right, should not be on our streets. Right. Even, even my friends in the military are like, I don't understand. Like, why would normal citizens have assault weapons? It doesn't make and like you're worried about someone breaking into your home. Fine, have your one shot pistol. Why do you need an assault weapon? What exactly is the point of that? That you don't necessarily know how to use anyway. Um, you know. And I mean, I think the other thing that's really important to point out is that gun violence is a women's issue. 
that if there's a gun in the house. It absolutely is. Domestic that, violence. And actually, oh, I was going to say October, but it's now November. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, I have been the victim of stalking, so not gun violence or not uh, domestic violence, but um, looking at the stalking laws as well, and they need to be reformed. But that actually really strongly ties into those um, gun violence prevention issues. Yeah, well. it's like the likelihood, I think, of, uh, you know, if there's a gun in the house of domestic violence turning into right. femicide, I think it's times 10, something like that. I mean, it's just yes. it's so incredibly stark. Um, also, reports are showing that more children than ever are being killed by gun violence. Yep. Um, the numbers have really gone up in terms of kids. So the likelihood, you know, people have a gun in the home that actually a kid is going to find the gun and kill himself versus or the, you know, people don't also don't look at gun violence and the risk of suicide. That yes. If there's a gun in the house, the and this ties into mental health care, right? If there's a gun in the house, the risk of suicide also, I, I think it triples. So, because you know, you you can't you can't go back from shooting yourself in the head. Yeah, that's, like, that's exactly not right. There's no coming back for that. So the the and that's actually becomes more of a men's issue because more men actually die from suicide than women do, um, even though more women attempt suicide because men are more likely to use yeah. guns. Yep, they so are. So they you know, that that's an issue that men should be concerned about, frankly, as well as that is suicide rates um, that they don't really pay attention to. Yep. So. So these all sound, you know, incredibly, incredibly important. Um, any other things that you want to, you know, want to bring up that you think are important for this race that you want to tell people about yourself or about the issues that you stand for? I think, you know, one of the things that is not necessarily super sexy, right, to talk about, but is so important, especially in Virginia, is improving our infrastructure to support our aging adult population, um, which is the fastest growing population in Virginia, we are not prepared for that. And it is coming whether we are prepared or not. Mm. We do not have the support staff to staff our assisted living facilities, our nursing mm. home. Um, and there are a lot of reasons behind that that I could get into, but um, we don't have enough affordable housing for our seniors. And that really needs to be addressed quickly. Um, and so our senior population is one that is neglected. It is mm. not the, the hot topic of the day, probably never will be, but it's something that's vitally important to Virginia. Um, and, so and everyone gets old. Nobody's excluded. <laughs> There's not a single person here that's excluded from that experience, including all of the plus 60 year old men you just talked about. That, so that is also true. So they should vote for me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's something that is near and dear to my heart. The first half of my career, I worked uh, as the lead nurse practitioner for the VCU Division of Geriatrics. And um, VCU is the big medical teaching hospital here in Richmond and in the state and um, did house calls. So VCU actually has a primary care program for people who are homebound. And I helped run that program. And for seven plus years, I went in and out of these patients' homes. It was predominantly elderly, but um, some younger patients as well. And, you know, when you see the challenges that they're facing, social isolation and how that plays into their health, um, it is something that has been deeply ingrained in me to care for that population. Of course, as, as it should be. And, I, you know, I, my mom had a knee replacement recently, and I took care of her. her I took care of her for a week. She'll tell you I didn't do anything, but I took care of her for a week and I was uh, losing my mind. You have to lose your mind. Caregiver is a huge issue. I was like, I was trying to work, but you know, I had to get my mom up to go to the bathroom and I had to, you know, I had to sleep there and just in case she had an emergency and I had to, you know, track her pills and make sure she wasn't taking too much yeah. of the same thing. And, and we, I, I eventually was like, why is there no state support? So we called and they basically said, and this is in Connecticut, which has, great resources. And they said they would send somebody twice a week, but the only purpose of that person was to help her take a shower. Yep. So they could come for one hour twice a week, carries, yep. but just to take a shower. I was like, well, what about all the other stuff? Right. And like, my mom's lucky that I came home, but even after a week, I was like, mom, I love you. I'm losing my mind over here. Like at my, my women's leadership um, students will tell you, I tell them that, you know, I'm always talking about compassion and kindness and generosity and I said, I am not a feminist leader when I do not sleep and do not exercise. 
I, I am like in tears. I'm a basket case. I can't focus. I'm irritable. You sound just like me. Oh, <laughs> I can't do it. Like and me. you know, and so my parents ended up hiring somebody private that charged twenty, you know, twenty five dollars an hour. And my mom's knee replacement recovery took months. And that's you know, we have the the my parents have the resources to do that. But what about the people that don't have the resources to do that? That's what I was going to say. You know, so Medicaid will pay for a personal carry for up to 30 hours a week um, to come into the home and help patients with bathing and cooking and all the things. Medicare doesn't. And it is ungodly expensive and unaffordable for most of our elderly. Um, And that's a big problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, but you're exactly right. I mean, caregiver strain and stress is something that we see time and time again, um, and which also leads to a lot of abuse and neglect of our elderly population as mm, well. That's so sad. And, you know, women, I, you know, we talk a lot about childcare, right? But women often, I, you know, I see this in teaching women's leadership, women get stuck with both. You know, yes. the majority of elderly care goes to women and the majority yes. of child care goes to women yep. and women are trying to work. And now you have these draconian abortion laws for like, God forbid, they have kids they don't want, uh, you know, and it's like, the, it's We're like, taking how, women out of the workforce. Right? How are you ever supposed to get ahead? It's just like, that is exactly throw me a freaking bone over here. That is exactly <laughs> right. Our ability to work is directly tied to our ability to survive and thrive and our autonomy. Right. Um, so, so, okay. So what can people do to support you in this last stretch? I'm convinced. I wish I was voting in your district. Maybe I'll come knock on doors for you this weekend. I do live near uh, Virginia, but what can people do to help out in this last stretch to help you win this race? So I need all the support, all the advocacy. Word of mouth is amazing. Um, just talking to friends and family. Um, truly when one person reaches out to someone directly that they know, it is so much more impactful. So people just saying, Hey, have you heard about this woman? She is running in this district and she is fantastic. I know her, or I've heard her speak and I think she's fantastic. That goes a very, very long way. Um, in terms of what else I need. So when we're talking about being able to reach voters, talk to voters, get my message across to voters, the most important thing, unfortunately, and we could talk about Virginia campaign finance and and the need for reform, because that is a whole nother uh, podcast episode I could go on and on. But um, the importance is I need money and I need money to be able to reach voters via television, via mail via digital, all of these things are ungodly expensive. And it's hard raising money right now with the congressional races going on. People don't understand or really think about how important their state and local politics and offices are to them, Um, but they are vitally important. And um, encouraging people to vote in those state and local elections is also something huge that people can do. But um, donations, any kind of contribution to help me reach voters would be amazing as well. And what's, what's, uh, how can people donate, Susanna? Where, where do they go to donate? So my website is SusannaGibson.com. It's S-U-S-A-N-N-A Gibson, G-I-B-S-O-N.com. And there is a donate button right there. Um, that is probably the easiest way for people. You can pay what- via Apple Pay or PayPal or a credit card. What about volunteering? You know, we have a big DC yes. contingency that listens to this uh, on down. podcast. So how can they, how can they, um, how can they come volunteer for you? So for there the is a volunteer link on my website as well, and you can right. sign up and we can reach out to them. Um, this particular district, I think door knocking is huge here. It is mm-hmm. so important. Um, and so door knocking postcard writing, because a lot of people are not comfortable knocking on doors. They say, oh, I'm not good at it. I personally love it. Um, it's the joy of campaigning is talking to people and getting to know people and listening to what yeah. issues they actually care about, because you cannot be an effective legislator. You cannot be an effective representative if you don't actually spend the time talking to people in your district that you're supposed to represent. I think I just want to, I want to repeat that for one second. You cannot be an effective legislature, le- legislator if you do not not spend time talking to the people in the district that you represent, which is also exactly you know, right. When we talk to Olivia later, um, talking about some of these races where people don't even live in the district and they're somehow running there. Anyway, another story. But I think that's that is absolutely incredibly important. It is, and a lot of people don't take the time to do that, and and that is 
the joy of this. And one of the things I'm best at is listening and talking and I actually care. So, but door knocking is great, but postcard writing, phone banking, all of the things are vitally important as well. And I am grateful for every single person who volunteers. So. Awesome. Well, so I hope you all will consider volunteering for Susanna at SusannaGibson.com, S-U-S-A-N-N-A Gibson.com. Consider volunteering. Uh, join me in donating. I'm donating to both of the campaigns of the women that were on the show tonight. So please join me in donating to them. And maybe, I don't know, maybe we can all go canvassing this weekend. Uh, <laughs> Richmond is not that far from D.C. So, um, Susanna, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. And I also, you know, I, I think it really is an interesting arc to think about, you know, the contributions of not just you as a woman, but as a female, you know, healthcare provider. Um, there's so many nuances to that. I mean, I heard it come out in gun violence. I heard it come out in caring for geriatric populations. I heard it come out in terms of reproductive rights. And you can tell that you really genuinely care about taking care of people. Yes, I that, do. Nurses are a good group of people generally, but yeah, I do. And I that's, do. I mean, that's being a public servant is taking care of people. So I think you'd make a tremendous public servant. And I hope that everybody here uh, really mobilizes on your behalf, Susanna. Thank you. And thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I will talk to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. You know, November 8th is coming up. As people said, this is the last stretch Donate, 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 volunteer, go knock on doors. If you are a Democrat, go to democrats.org to sign up and to see volunteer opportunities. Knocking on doors really, really does work. And this last stretch really makes the last bit of difference. And go beyond those people that you see on MSNBC, on CNN, and on Fox. Go to those local candidates. You could tell, hearing from Susanna, they really need our support, but they're often overshadowed by congressional races, which get more of the money and the glamour and the PR. But yet, as Olivia was saying, building that bench is so important because the state senators become the congresspersons, become the senators, become the vice presidential nominees. Uh, you know, it, it, it really is a line. Even school level PTO is a breeding ground for future congresspersons, for future senators, for future attorneys generals of a state. So, you know, really volunteer for those local candidates. If you're somebody that says, I don't do politics, well, I go to my friend, Michael Sani, who runs something called Bite the Ballot in the UK. And he says, if you don't do politics, Politics will do you. Politics is embedded in all of our lives. We cannot ignore it. It affects whether you get your bill paid for when you go to the hospital. It affects whether you have clean water or clean air. It affects your job opportunities. It affects your, you know, being able to get an abortion. It affects your education. It affects such a sex education. I mean, there's so many things that politics does affect within your lives. And yet people seem to know more about fantasy football or, you know, uh, sports sports statistics than they do about their congressperson. So also get educated before you vote. Do your research, figure out what's going on, see if you can vote early. A lot of places now have voting early so you can go in and vote early before the election, but do not miss these elections on November 8th. If you liked this episode, please share it with your social media on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, I don't care, whatever you're on, TikTok, please share this episode. We are also on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. So if you're listening to this on YouTube, please subscribe to us and give us that five-star rating on uh, Spotify and Apple so that people can find us and are able to hear this content and coverage. There's a lot of right-wing YouTubers out there, especially women. That's part of why I started this show because there were very few on the left that were covering politics that are women on YouTube. And I, you know, I, I need your help to get these voices out there. I cannot do this alone. So I'm asking you to help me and to help these amazing women running for office. Lastly, you can really show your support by becoming a member on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Politics, S-A-M-A-N-T-H-R-O, and then the word politics for as little as $3 a month to support our production costs, to support all of the time and research and energy that goes into the producing this show. I also want to thank Zach at Stream Inspectors. The Every time I say, hey, Zach, can you put up that slide? Zach has been doing this show with me for two years. Stream Inspectors are the leaders in live stream production. If you want a really cool show like this, look up Stream Inspectors. Maybe you can even get me to come host it for you. Depends on the topic, 
but we can work that out. But look up stream inspectors. I think that's it for tonight. Uh, you know, I'm excited to see what happens on November 8th, and we'll see you on the next episode of Samantha Politics. Thanks again for listening, and good night.